want to uplift the name of Jesus and to give him praise. Our scripture tonight will come from Psalm 96, verses 1 through 4. Psalm 96, verses 1 through 4. And it says, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods.
name is great. And greatly to be praised. Amen. Thank God. Tonight we're looking at two passages of scripture. Matthew chapter 6 and John chapter 17. Both in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 6 and John chapter 17. I would normally say we're going to compare them, but we're going to contrast them. There will be some similarities, but most of it is a contrast, meaning that they are different. There are differences there. We look at those differences. Matthew chapter 6, John chapter 17. Let me say this right away. In Matthew chapter 6, we have the model prayer. Matthew chapter 6, we have what we know as the model prayer. It is not the Lord's prayer. It's also found in Luke chapter 11. We have the model prayer. Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. And Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. We know it as the model prayer, the model prayer. We'll be looking at Matthew chapter 6. And Luke chapter 11 is the parallel, but we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6 and John chapter 17. Look at Matthew chapter 6. We have what is called the model prayer. It's called the model prayer because Jesus sets a model. He sets forth a model by which we are to pray. In, in Matthew chapter 6 and Luke chapter 11. The disciples want to know, teach us to pray. Can you, will you teach us to pray? And Jesus sets this model in place. He says, when you pray, you ought to pray like this. That's a model. If you walk in my office, you will find some cars in there. About 20 of them. Now somebody said, you can't get but one car in there if you got one in there. But there are some model cars in there. About 20 of them or so. Model cars. What that says is, this is a way that they look. This is the way it's done. It is a model. It's not a car that you ride in, but they're about two inches long. These are model cars. They got colors. They got wheels. <laughs> These are models, but you can't sit in them. You can't drive them. Every little boy that comes in there want to take one home. These are model cars. These are things that shows us how cars are made. Even how fake engine is. has a model engine. One little boy came by and took my helicopter. It was a model helicopter. So in Matthew chapter 6, we have what is known as a model prayer. Begin at verse number 8. Therefore do not be like them for your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. New King James says, in this manner, therefore pray. I think the King James says, pray like this. So what he's setting forth is a model. Let me point out a few things, then I'll go to John chapter 17. In Matthew chapter 6, verse number 9, he says, pray like this, or when you pray, you pray in this manner. He says, our Father in heaven. King James says, our Father which art in heaven. He says, when you pray, first thing you do is acknowledge God. Secondly, he says, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. 
Second thing he says, acknowledge God, but then glorify his name. Magnify his name. Acknowledge him and then glorify his name. This is a what kind of prayer? A model prayer. When you pray, you pray like this. You give God the glory, you acknowledge him as God. He's the only God who can, who can bless you. He's the only God who can answer your prayers. Our Father, and he says our because he's not just my Father, he's your Father too. If you're, you're born again, if you're saved, he's your Father too. So Jesus says when you pray, find out, be for sure that you're talking to the right God. He's our Father. Then he says, glorify him, lift him, praise him, honor him. Hallowed be thy name. Then he points out some other things about God. He says, your kingdom come. Tonight we're going to be looking at everywhere it says me, everywhere it says your, everywhere it says yours, everywhere it says your whatever. He says, your kingdom come. Mm -hmm. Whose kingdom? God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. We acknowledge him as God. We see him as God. We know him as our father. He says, Lord, your kingdom. Let it come. Let it come on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom. Mm -hmm. So we see the word your kingdom. The word your is there. Then he says what? Your will be done. Both of these are about God, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done. God, I got some will that I want to be done, but Lord, I submit to your will. Let your will be done above my will. When we pray this, Jesus says in this model of prayer, you need to be concerned about God's will more than your will. There's a word again, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then he says some things to us, some things for us, some things about us. First thing he says, give us. Next thing he says, forgive us. Next thing he says, lead us. And the final thing, deliver us. Then he goes back to God again, verse number, number, verse number 13. For yours is the kingdom. For yours is the power. For yours is the glory. For how long? Forever and ever and ever. Jesus says when you pray, you ought to make sure that you honor God. Make sure that you, you desire that God's name be elevated. In your prayer, Jesus says this model prayer you want God's kingdom. Wherever there's a kingdom, there's a king, right? Mm -hmm. The question is, who's your king? Mm -hmm. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And then he says, give us this day our daily bread. This is a model prayer, right? Yeah. So Jesus is giving us the blueprint. Mm -hmm. He's giving us the drawings. He's giving us the prints. He's giving us a model. He said, before you ask God for anything, somebody give us this day, honor him first. Acknowledge him first. Desire his kingdom first. Desire his will first. Desire his name first. Honor his name. And after, after, after you have honored him, after you Ask for his kingdom after you bless his name, after you you said, God, I glorify you. After you said, God, let your will be done, then there's no problem to ask for David for it. Give us this daily bread. Then he says, forgive us because we got some debts. Mm -hmm. Anybody have some debts? Hmm. Yes. I mean, I'm not talking about the car no either. Uh, mm. We got some sin debts. We have sin debts. We messed up. We've said some things. We act some kind of way. We act like we forgot who we were in the Lord. 
How many of you ever had tell somebody to piece of your mind? I mean, just a little bit. You have to give them a piece of what you were thinking. You forgot momentarily who you were. You forgot who God was and forgot who God is. So you have to come and say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive us. These are debts. Sins are debts. Paul says that because of sin and when you sin, you have a payday. And you have a payment to make. Debt is a payment that you got to pay. Hmm. Forgive us. Forgive us our debts. Forgive us our sins. Then he says, Lord, forgive us as we forgive other people. You want God to forgive you. Who have you forgiven lately? Hmm. Hmm. Forgive us as we forgive our debt towards. Verse 13 says, do not lead us into temptation. The first part is about God. The second part is about us. Do not lead us into temptation. Lord, that I am so tempted. Have you been to a point where you couldn't trust yourself? Have you been somewhere that you knew before you went in there you couldn't trust yourself to do the right thing before you got there? Every wedding I participate in, I know when they give them the license, time for me to go. I know when the music changes. From Lord, I lift your name on high to boom, 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 boom. I know it's time to go. What was that, Saturday? I looked at Pastor Bell. Pastor Bell looked at, at me and I was like, yeah, Doc, it's that time. The DJ revved it up a little bit. It usually happened right after the first dance of the bride and groom. <laughs> Lord, forgive me and lead me. Lead me into temptation. Because I'm going to tell you something. I'm guilty. When the music gets right, I find myself patting my feet. <laughs> and don't let Frank and Beverly and Mays come on. Don't let them play real music when music was music. Yeah. Right. Don't, don't, don't let the Commodores come on, whether they talking about Jesus or not. <laughs> even, even if Parliament comes on, I said, Lord, leave me not to temptation. Don't let me start popping. Don't let me start moonwalking. <laughs> no, don't let that song come on. You want to funk? Y'all act like y'all like aware of it. The Bible says, Jesus says in the model prayer, lead me not into temptation. That's right. Don't let the gap man say, no, no, no. Lead me not into temptation. All this is about me. All this is about us. And then he says, deliver us from the evil one or from all evil. Deliver us. Let me tell you all, we can't handle the devil by ourselves. We just can't do it. We just don't have the equipment to do it. We just not able to do it. Lord, Keep me away from the evil one and keep the evil one away from me. Yes, I know you're spiritual. I know you've been saved a long time. I know you go to church on Sunday. Mm -hmm. But the devil has some tricks that you haven't seen. It's the same old soup just going over. Y'all do know what that means, right? <laughs> same old soup just going over. Everybody? Everybody with me? A few people nodding their head. The devil got some tricks that we haven't seen, but it's the same old thing. Just some of it is not even worn over. Some of us are victim to the same old traps, same old schemes, same old thing over and over again. 
But Jesus says in your prayer, ask God to deliver you from the evil one, deliver you from all evil. That's right. What kind of prayer is this? Model. It's a model prayer. First part deals with who? God. God. The last part deals with who? Yes. And then he goes back and, and he, he talks about it again in verse 13. He says, for yours is the kingdom. Hmm. King James said, for God is the kingdom. For God is the power. For God is the glory. Forever and ever. Amen. It sandwiches us in between how we ought to glorify God. Jesus says in your prayer time, this is the model you have to go by. And when you go by this model, you can't miss it. All you do then is just wait on the Lord. And the focus is on God first. The focus is on us next. And the focus is on God last. When you pray. In our prayers, Jesus says, in verse number 13, Jesus says you ought to get excited in your prayer. You ought to be excited about who God is at the beginning. Then you ought to be excited about who God is as you end your prayer. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, I glorify you. Lord, I lift up your kingdom. Lord, I know the power belongs to you. Lord, I know the glory is yours forever and ever and ever. It reminds you because God already knows it reminds you, this model of prayer reminds you to always put God first That's right. and always celebrate who God is. It's a model of prayer. So we're looking at your, your, your. We're looking at mine, mine, mine. And then we look at your, your, your. God is such an awesome God that we ought to give him the glory. Amen. And when we give God the glory, God does great and mighty things. Amen. Jeremiah says he does great and mighty things that you don't even know about. Yes, haven't even heard about. Haven't even read about. Haven't even Googled it to. <laughs> God will do great and mighty things Amen. that you have not heard about. So that is what it's called the model prayer. Let's go to John chapter 17. This model prayer is also found in Luke chapter 11. John chapter 17 is what is known as the Lord's Prayer. It's Jesus' Prayer. And in this prayer, this, this Lord's Prayer, there are three different prayers being prayed. It's one continual prayer, but it prays three different, for three different areas, three different groups of people. First of all, the first story we could read, Verses 1 through 5, Jesus prays for himself. And if you have a Bible that indicates where your pericope starts and stops, you will see that Jesus prays for himself. Jesus prays for himself. And then verses 6 through 19, you find that Jesus is praying for his disciples. Are you his disciple? And finally, in verses 20 through 26, in that book, Ripperby, Jesus prays for all believers, believers past, present, and future. Where are you listening here? Are you in here? Because one thing Jesus says. I'm not praying for the world. I'm not praying for unbelievers. I'm praying for those who you have given me. I'm praying for those who say, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father. Who was he talking to? Father. Who was he talking to in the model prayer? Father. Our Father. He says, Father, my hour has come. When Jesus talks about his hour coming, he means that it's time for him to go to the cross. Mm -hmm. 
What does it mean when he says down here to go to the cross? It, time, it is time for him to die. Signs his own death certificate. How many of you want to sign your own death certificate? Anybody? Anybody? No one? How many of you want to live all the days God has for you? Everybody want to live all the days God has for you? Can we intercept that? Can we interrupt that? Can we shorten that? Nope. No. No? Nope. I think so. Somebody thinks so. Yeah, if uh, we can shorten that by doing those things that's going to kill you. Drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, God didn't add that to you. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Accidents. Okay. Being disobedient to your parents. See, try to get it, Deborah. I mean, I'm like right that. Take the battle out of here. Take it out here. Being disobedient to your parents. My very best friend in the whole world always says one thing. I know I'm going to live to be 100 because I was not disobedient to my parents. Mm. Disobedient to your parents. Whether or not you walk out the door disobediently and you die, or whether you have a you have been given some time because God is long suffering. Yes. God is long suffering. And tell you, I'm gonna tell you something. Sometimes trouble will catch up with you that you created for yourself. Now I'm gonna tell you, I can talk about I'm not gonna I'm not gonna die today. I can say it as long as I want to. But right outside, they're driving about 80 miles an hour down that rough road. Sure right. I can act a fool and walk out there if I want to. <laughs> if the brother doesn't want to hit me, he can't stop. Did I just shorten my life? Yep. Or is that just God's designated time? <laughs> well, you shorten your life. I shorten my life. Yeah, you just don't fly with God's time. There. I comply with God's now. <laughs> well, let me let me make sure you know the question I'm asking. I'm not asking you, does God know the time or the day? We know God knows the time, right? Yeah. God even knows how we're gonna leave here. But I told you, if you find drugs in my system, that is foul play. So I can shorten my time and other folk can shorten my time, right? <laughs> Brother, I already told you, you mess over mom and daddy, you're you going to be out of here soon. <laughs> now, it may be as a teenager, it may be as a preteen, it may be in your 50s, 60s, or 70s. But let me tell you, there's a list being made, and God is not checking it twice. <laughs> he knows if you've been naughty or nice. Yeah. I told you earlier, we got debts we're going to pay. People don't think that when they do wrong with their parents, that those are debts to pay. Mm. Mm. So we, we still half and half now? Mm. I'm not asking you, does God know your time? I'm not asking you that. Mm. I'm asking you, do you have control and can shorten your time? That's what I'm asking. Yes, no, maybe so. Somebody thinking, somebody changing their mind. Yes, sir. Because God promised you four scores. Each score is 20 years. That's 80 years. If you uh, if you do something to, uh, like say, disobedient to your parents, God can shorten that time because God got a designated time for you to die. But you can shorten that by being disobedient to your parents. Okay, so you're talking about uh, three scores in 10, 70, right? Yeah, right. So this is your homework assignment. <laughs> Does God promise it, or do we say God promised it? Because we got a lot, of, a lot of people that's living for the Lord that's dying before they get seventy, right? right? I may not ever make it. I may surpass it, mm -hmm. but it won't be because I did something crazy like walk out in the street, or I did math, mm -hmm. or I did some crazy stuff. But I've done some stuff in the past. God won't hold my sins against me forever. But guess what? We have to live out our mess. We got to live out our mess, right? And, and our mess causes us to fail. I shoot some stuff in my vein tonight. It wouldn't take about that. 
That much. I mean, I can get high off the dentist shooting me in my gums and pass out because of tolerance, right? If you haven't done it in a while or you haven't done it for a long period, just a little bit. I mean, when I go to the doctor or the hospital, they save a lot of anesthesia. Mm -hmm. And we talked and they said, they said, put this mask on and before it hit my face. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? It's because we we damage our own selves, right? Mm -hmm. And if your body has not built up any immunity by intaking this stuff, boy, the, by the time the woman start to turn the gauge on and, and put the mask up in my face, she's back over there turning it back on. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking crazy about it. Mm -hmm. When I come out of it, I'm still talking crazy. I know that's right. Are you with me? So, the question on the table, okay. can you shorten your time? What's your homework assignment? To see what God is really saying about three scores in 10. See what God is really saying about 70 years. What does God really say? Or is that what we've said? Right? Think about it. The other question is, we already know God knows when, where we're going to leave here. He knows how we're going to leave it. He knows who we're going to be with. He knows, he knows whether we're going to be by ourselves or not. He already knows that. He knows if we're going to get a chance to close our Facebook page down, because that's the thing now. Always close your Facebook page down. Assign somebody to close your Facebook page down. We gotta get this brother to the twenty first century. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have to, we 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 put up all this stuff. We're more concerned about pay, uh, uh, about closing out our Facebook page than we are about walking with the Lord. Isn't that something? So does God know? That's y'all the homework assignment. We already know that God knows, but can we can we cut our day short? suicide. God knew it though, right? Right. Do we cut it short? Or would it just not? That's a big assignment there. Yeah, that's a big <laughs> Yes, sir. What, what, do the enemy have anything to do with it? The enemy has a lot to do with it. The question is, does the enemy have anything to do with it? He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. John chapter 10. He comes to kill shit. The enemy wants to mess up your mind so you can mess up your body. Right. And as you mess up your body, you mess up your spirit. Mm -hmm. Even when you're saved, I don't know how we got this far here. <laughs> <laughs> I guess somebody asked some questions. I'm still dealing with it 10 minutes later. <laughs> but this is Bible study, right? We go, we're going to John chapter 17. Even when you say the devil is still after you, Jesus says to Peter, 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 the devil want to have you. Matter of fact, the devil has asked permission for you. And the devil wants to sift you as if you're sifting wheat. What's a sifter? Anybody know what a sifter is? Everybody know what a sifter is, right? Yeah. What does a sifter do? It breaks it down. Small, Breaks it down small pieces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, does it, what else does the sifter do? Take out the it takes the bad out and keeps the good in, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got a good lesson on that growing up in the parents, on the plantation. <laughs> we would ride through the wheat field and the rice field, and, the, and this is called a combine. And then it would throw out the good into the basket and throw the bad back into the yard. Now, how that machine knows that, I don't know. But one thing I do know, God knows what's best. That's right. And the devil wants to take the, take the very best. Yes. Have you ever heard a statement when somebody is killed in a senseless murder? Mm -hmm. Oh, he was the best in the community. Mm -hmm. The devil wants the very best. 
The, very, the, the devil wants the very best person in the community. The outstanding one, the one who had all A's, or one, the one who was a model student, a model uh, citizen. The devil wants the very best. I think he wants you even more so when you're saved. When you're saved, the devil's, the devil's mad at you. <laughs> How many people in here saved? Born again, love the Lord, that kind of can't on. The devil's mad at you because you're on the Lord's side. That's right. He knows he can't touch your soul. He knows he can't have your soul. But guess what the devil does? He won't like make your life miserable until you turn away from God. Jesus said in these last days there will be a great falling away. I want to serve you notice those days are here. There are, in the last days people will be, be falling away from God, falling away from the church. They won't even hear the word. They will, they will have Ears that to be tickled by wise fable. They want to believe in a lie more than they believe in the word. Mm -hmm. That day here, that day is upon us. Yes, it is. That day is happening right now. And because that day is happening right now, I want to let you know the devil is real. And now we're in John chapter 17. Mm -hmm. Jesus is praying. Even Jesus is praying for us. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, Jesus says, first of all, my hour has come. And he says, glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. He says, when the son of God is glorified, it equals to God being glorified. Such it is with us. As we glorify God, as we live our lives, God gets to glory. We glorify God. How do we glorify God? Just in living our lives, how do we glorify God? Doing his will. Doing his will. And that leads right back to Matthew chapter 6. Your will be done. Mm -hmm. How many of you have your own will? Anybody have their own will? Everybody does. Everybody does? Well, you and I have a great conversation tonight. <laughs> everybody, everybody has a will, right? And, and you want some stuff? Yeah. You want some things? And some people want some people. You want some things, right? And you want things to happen your way. Your will is, Lord, I want you to do it this way. I heard a brother say the other day that, that women want things that they can't bring to the table themselves. We, tell, we oftentimes tell women to make out a checklist and paint a picture of what they want in a man. You want to give us your list, Sister Burn? <laughs> so his sister says she says I want him to have a job mm -hmm. then she said I want him to be almost ready to retire so we can travel mm -hmm. and I want him to make six figures or more mm -hmm. I want his, his uh, beacon score to be 800 to 825 wow. and I want, I want him to have his own house I just want to be ready to move in there so the preacher asks her, how many of these things you want you have? <laughs> so the preacher said, he said, he said, he said now, now you want him to have a beacon score of 825. Mm -hmm. And you got a beacon score of 560. Mm -hmm. I want all his children to be grown, gone, and on and on. I don't put up any children. And you got a 16-year-old. <laughs> right in the prime of foolishness. We all have our own will, right? Mm -hmm. And as we have our own will, we forget what God is up to. Next week, we start this book. Next week, we start this book, Experiencing God, next week, right? Mm -hmm. And one of, the, one of the factors in here is that God is at work all around you. Mm -hmm. And because God is at work all around you, you don't want God to come join you where you are, do you? Your answer is yes. <laughs> We always want God to come join us where we are. Now, God, I have gotten into this mess. And we don't even tell God like that. We, we don't tell God, God, I've gotten into this mess. I need you to get me out of this mess. <laughs> we come to God like, God, now I need your help now. This is me. We can get so humble when we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So, God is at work around us. Let's join God when He's at work. And not depend on God always to join us while we ever. Hmm. I'm not just 
just say? What, what did that just mean? We got our own little thing going and we've excluded God. And since we've excluded God, God, we want you to come over here where I am. I don't really want you to get me out of my mess, but get in my mess with me. Yes, sir. I was just going to say, God, everybody wants, when you're doing good, you ain't needing God. But as soon as things go bad, first thing you do, you're calling on God. You're calling on God. Calling on God. Because, you know, we've heard, we don't have to go into deep prayer. We can just call on God in split seconds. So we use that, that five-state religion every time. So Jesus says, Lord, glorify me, your son, so ultimately I can glorify you. He, he says, God, glorify me because, God, I have given eternal life to those you gave me. How many people do you meet that you offer eternal life? How many people have you led to Christ in your Christian life? Statistics says that only 3% of the Christians have dedicated themselves to witnessing for the Lord. That is a tragedy. I mean, where you actually willingly, openly, intentionally introduce somebody to Christ. Next time you go out to lunch, just ask one question. The way they finish serving you and you love the way they serve you or you didn't like the way they serve you. Ask one question. What is it that I can pray for you concerning? And it opens up right every single time I've done it. Guess what happened? Tears start flowing, somebody going through something. And then they just open up at the table, at the table. At the, I mean, right there in front of everybody at the table. They'll tell you that they're on drugs. They'll tell you that they've been struggling. They'll tell you they've been sober for 10 years. They'll tell you that, that the devil is after them again. And, and, and they're asking God to lead them not into temptation. They'll tell you right there on the spot. So once you ask that question, that opens the door, right? And once the door is open, you don't want to let them leave without making a statement. Is that and that statement is Jesus can help you in your trouble. You don't want to make them any promises that it's going to go away overnight. You want to make sure that you tell them since you're in trouble, Jesus can help you while you're in your trouble. Sometimes people turn away from the church. They turn away from God when they need God the most. Like the brother said, sometimes people get so stuck on what they have and what they've accomplished, they don't need God anymore. Mm -hmm. But the same person, when they get down on their luck, they show back up for God. Mm -hmm. And then you have a third group that that third group is, they get so mad at God, they walk way away from him. And they blame God for the decisions they made. Mm -hmm. Are you blaming God for your decisions? And check this out. There is a group who didn't do it on their own. Nobody else pushed them into it. It's just a way of life. You need God to. Mm -hmm. Nobody did anything. You didn't do anything. It just happened. The Bible says rain will fall on the just as well as the unjust. What does that mean? Rain will fall on the just as well as the unjust. What does that mean? Is that just something we say? Everybody have trouble. Y'all, anybody in the room got trouble? <laughs> Don't point at your trouble. The, the, the Hebrew writer says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finish of our faith. What that says to me is, I see my trouble, I acknowledge my trouble, my trouble is real. But I don't have to do anything but glance at my trouble and then I look to Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of my face. He's the one that gives us eternal life. Yes, sir. I want to say also you run into people all the time that 
always say I've ran into people where I try to tell them about God and they will be like, well, when I get my life together, I come to church. Why don't you let God get you, help you get your life together so you can see him working in your life? Yes. You know, I've always, said, I always run into people like, man, as soon as I get my life together, I'm coming out. Let God work, help, help you get your life together so you can see him working in your life. Matter of fact, we can't get our lives together. Yeah. No. Amen. I, I'm a living testimony. Mm -hmm. you, you can't get it together on your own. I mean, you can work hard, you can pray hard, you can act like you want to change things, but Paul says in Romans chapter 7 that the war is going on within you and there's a struggle with getting your life together. Paul says in Romans 7 that every time I'm with you good, evil is present with me. Then when he gets to verse 24, he just comes to a conclusion. In Romans chapter 7 verse 24, he comes to this conclusion. Oh, wretched man that I am. The word wretched means I'm beat up or beat down. Mm -hmm. Oh, wretched man that I am, a man that's suffering through a lot of internal stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, right here, counselors could be <sighs> making a lot of money mm -hmm. because we all got internal stuff. And some of our stuff go way back. Yeah. Some of our stuff is deep-seated mm -hmm. that you, you can't take a shell and dig it out. It's going to take God to fix it. Amen. The way we view things, think about the way you view things. The way you view church, the way you do you view work, mm -hmm. it's because of what you saw growing up, right? Mm -hmm. It's because of what they put into you. It's because one person would say, I told my children they were going to college. And guess what they did? They went to college. <laughs> the girls sit with their legs crossed at their ankle. Or they sit with their leg crossed across the knee is because of the way they were trained to do it. And then when you see girls that didn't cross at all, it's the way that they didn't, didn't get trained to do it. Are you with me? People can say, one of the worst things that I think a woman can do is have a filthy mouth. <sighs> a filthy, man, it's, it's nothing like a seaport sailor cussing woman. <laughs> Whether she mad, Sister Brown, or not mad. And some of them just do it for the joy of it. But we can't we can't frown on them. I just don't like it. Jesus has given us eternal life, and then he says that it is finished. He says, not only have I given them eternal life, I have turned them toward the true God. And Jesus, whom I have sent. In other words, God, you sent me, and now I have sent them. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work. Jesus had finished the work that he came here to do. He's, he's, he's at this point getting ready to usher in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit then comes so you can speak in tongues. I've heard people speak in tongues for an hour. And before they hit the door, they cuss them out. <laughs> I've seen people shout, shout and holler, hallelujah. And I just, I said, I just saw you walk in the door and mistreat the, the homeless man. So the Holy Spirit didn't come so you can shout. He didn't come so you can speak in tongues. The Holy Spirit came that he will reside in us, live in us, and make us better people. Because you do know the Holy Spirit is subject to your spirit, right? That's right. If you choose not to yield to him, mm. he can't make you do anything. It's kind of like, like, like your, your, your parents. They, they, they can make you do stuff in the house while you're around them. Don't you dare wear them clothes no more. Okay, mom. And when they get out there, they got the clothes that she told them don't wear up under the clothes they, that she. Uh -uh. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, he unctions us. He speaks to us. He nudges us. But he doesn't make us do stuff. We have to release ourselves to him. We have to yield ourselves to him. 
We choose to do what we want to do. Matter of fact, people said, the devil made me do it. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, we are led astray by our own fleshly desires. Because we have a sin nature. And our sin nature loves sin. We love it. When you hear a brother or sister talking about those were the good old days back then, they still struggling with that sin nature. When I go home, we go down 49, and I, we pass this little bit spot on the road called uh, Renova, Mississippi. We used to drive way back in the cotton fields to this little little shack cafe called the called the Cotton Club. What kind of a jump is that? It's called a Cotton Club. It's in Renova, Mississippi. It's about it's about one eighteenth the size of this room. And folk get packed in there. We thought we were having a good time. <laughs> it was a juke joint. <laughs> it was a rundown shack. And we listened to the radio all the way over there, and the DJ is talking, and he's talking about, oh, two, three little honeys just walked through the door. We get there, there's a bunch of hard legs there. <laughs> God changes our personalities as we allow him to. God changes our will as we allow him to. That's why we have to continue to pray for our children, our neighbors, our friends, our enemies. So God can make the change. And see, when you pray for your, your friends, your enemies, your children, you got to pray, God, that the Holy Spirit sneaks up on them. Because if they find out you pray for them, they put up a bigger fight. <clears throat> they don't sing those songs like we say, my mama prayed for me, had me on her mind, took the time, and, and we rejoicing in him, but I doubt they ain't rejoicing. The Holy Spirit, Jesus says, I have done it, I finished it, and now I'm going to glorify you. And then he says, Whatever you do, God, understand that we are unified. We are together. And bring them together and, and make sure that they are in unity like we are. Verses 6 through verse 19 talks about the fact that Jesus wants his disciples to be unified. He wants the disciples to be unified. And look in there. Look at how many times the word your or yours are used. How many times do you see, and you don't have to count right now in your, in your Bible study time as you're doing your research for next Sunday, next Wednesday. <laughs> he says, I have manifest your name to the men. We, I have manifest your name to other men. I have presented you before other people. How often do we present ourselves before people and we glorify God in the middle of it? Or do we glorify ourselves? Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And the pride of life is feeding folk up. Pride come before the fall. And right before you fall, there's your pride. <laughs> What that means, when, when he says pride comes before the fall, what he's really saying is, the moment you get prideful, you get ready to fall. And God is so, so long suffering, he just lets you do your thing, and you do it for a long time, and you think that you got it going on. All the time I told brothers, I said, man, you got to walk around and talk about, I'm the man of this house. Guess what? You ain't the man of that house. If you got to walk around talking about, I'm the man with the britches on here, acting like George Jefferson. <laughs> George Jefferson shows up, I'm the man with this house, about this talk. <laughs> and you knew the weeds he was in the woman of the house. Yep. If you got to brag about it, if you got to be prideful about it, you, you get headed for a fall. You gotta be proud about what you own, what you have, how much money, how much you are. If, that, if that's your pride, and you're not proud of who Jesus is, I'm so proud of who my big brother Jesus is. 
Amen. <laughs> See, the difference between Jesus and other gods are Jesus and other presidents, Jesus and other governors, Jesus and other mayors, is that they send men off the war. They send 17, 18, 19 year old children off the war to fight for them. But my great commander, the general himself, Jesus, went off the war and gave his life for us. Amen. That's a big difference. It doesn't matter who the president of the United States is, they don't send no children off the war. I tell children all the time, you don't join the military to see the world, you join the military to fight. Because there's a chance of it if you're going to have to fight. I mean, they paint that beautiful picture of how, how you're going to see the world. And we're going to station you in Japan. And you ain't seen Japan yet. You've been in there 10 years. And then they paint the picture of you. We're going to pay for your education. They may pay for it when you get out. But if a war breaks out, you go going to war. War takes place before your education. Amen. Jesus says, God, I manifest myself. And I manifest you. Verse, verse 19, verse 9, he says, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. I thought it was so tragic when I heard a pastor stand up and say, don't pray for this family ever again. Mm -hmm. You thought it was tragic too, didn't you? <laughs> well, you should have seen your faces. The pastor stood up and said, look, church, don't, do not pray for this family at all. Let them do what they do. Let them go where they want to go. To the whole congregation, don't pray for them anymore. Here we see Jesus. 33 and a half years, Jesus praying for the world that he do not lose anybody. Jesus praying for the unsaved. He, the miracles that Jesus did was so that men might believe. And here we are in verse number nine. He says, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. But for those whom you have given me. Jesus is only praying for the disciples. He's only praying for the Christians. Jesus is our example, right? He's saying there ought to come a point in your life where you spend your prayer time on those who are believers. And then as we go through all the verses, we'll find out all the way to verse number 26. He's praying that they learn to love each other like you have loved me. He's praying that, that they learn to love each other and be unified like you and I are unified. He says, Father, uh, bless them to glorify you as I have glorified you. He says, make sure whatever you do, God, they honor your name. This is where they are. Uh, Matthew chapter 6 and John chapter 17 are as one because God's name is to be glorified. In our prayer time, we've spent a month praying, I hope, spending time with God, spending time with our family in prayer. And Jesus is praying for us. In the Lord's prayer, he is saying, Lord, unite them. Lord, unify them. Lord, make sure they are one. What would it be like if the church, the universal church, was one? What would it be like if, if New Beginning and Holy Trinity and Holman Street and Pleasant Valley and Mount Pilgrim and Mount New Jerusalem, what if all those churches were one? And if they all were one, it would be a great love great uniting and a great demonstration of glorifying God. Be on one accord. We would be on one accord. Amen. And when you're on one accord, miracles happen. Amen. When you're on one accord, God is glorified. Yes, Lord. Jesus spends this whole chapter. First of all, he prayed for himself. Secondly, he prayed for his disciples. And finally, he prays for all believers. So we don't have any excuse. Jesus prayed for us. It's good that mom and dad and the pastor prayed for us, but most of all, Jesus 
has prayed for us and what we know as the Lord prayer. Saint Jesus that prayed, gave his life, died for us on Calvary, rose from the dead, and he did all of that for us. Yes, he did. When you look at the final prophetic speech, Jesus says, now God, I'm going to return back to you so we can be one again in the same place. And so Jesus died and was buried for us and rose for us that we can be in the same place. John 14 says, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you will be also. Amen. And we will be on one call. Amen. There won't be no temple challenges in heaven. Amen. There won't be no lying, no backbiting in heaven. Amen. Jesus is fixing it so we can be in order for you to be one with Jesus, you must be born again. The door of the church is open. Amen. You need to be born again. The door of the church is open. And this is your opportunity to get to know Jesus. Amen. Trust him as your Savior. Yes, Lord. That Jesus Christ died on the cross, buried in a barley tomb, rose early that third day morning with all power. Just believe in that story. You could be saved today. If you would, bow your head with me and repeat after me and invite Jesus Christ into your life and you will be saved. Say these simple words, this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe that if you honestly pray this prayer, believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you are now born again. And when you leave earth, you're on your way to heaven. If you're looking for a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. Please let us know if you want to be a part of this great church in Southeast Houston. We'll welcome you and be glad that you have come. Amen. Father God, we thank you now. We honor your name. We thank you for our opportunity to pray, to call on you. We ask you to bless us, Father God. Go with us and stand by. Bless us always to glorify you. Bless us to follow the examples that Jesus has set. Bless us to realize that you are God. This is your world and not ours. We ask you, Father God, to bless our church to be a beacon light for others to see. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us join together by saying, Amen. Amen. Please remember next week we start on the book, Experiencing God. Experiencing God. Next week we start on the book, Experiencing God. A great lesson. It's probably going to take us about a year and a half to complete it. But uh, it's, it's 12 sessions, and we want to make sure that we find the seven realities that we are living in. Everybody living in these same seven realities. God is at work all around us. We need to join God where he is. Can I give uh, say a short testimony? Yes, sir. I went for a job interview uh, yesterday and I wrestled that night. The devil attacked me about the job. So I went in there. I waited and finally get the guy came in to interview me. He said his, his grandfather was a preacher and so said, I gave him my testimony on what I've been through. All I talked about was God. And before, after, before his betray leave, he, I said, man, I feel like he said, man, I feel good. I feel like we had church. Wow. And so, but, so after that, he said, well, man, I got other people to interview. He shook my hand. I went out the door. He went in and said something to his supervisor before I could get in the car. He done ran out the door and said, come back. You got the job. Wow. <laughs> you got the job. She was in the car waiting. We both smiled. If I could even get in the car. You got a wife too? Yes, I do. <laughs> 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 you got a wife. Oh, 
Yes, yeah, so you came two thousand miles to get a job. Yes, I did. Don't Amen. You? She couldn't want to deal with the cold. She said, "We gotta come where it's warm." Guess where I'm from? Father, I'm following my baby. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God for a great God. testimony. Just, Amen. Just, I mean, that, it was just, I never had a man just chase me out the door and say, you got the job. Just Amen. Back. He didn't even interview nobody else. Just gave me the job. Amen. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Boy, he came 2,000 miles. Me and brothers around here said he came down the job. Hallelujah. Have mercy. Jesus. While we stand, our vision and mission statement, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, in I, if I be lifted up to from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. God bless you, God keep you. Please remember to give your offering at lifting.jesus at yahoo.com, lifting.jesus at yahoo.com, or you can mail in your offering to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. God bless you and keep you is our plan.